Hi, and welcome to the B'nai B'rith International Podcast. I'm CEO Dan Mary Asher. Thanks for spending some time with us. On today's episode, you'll hear my special conversation with celebrated actor Nehemiah Persoff. But first, one quick reminder. Check out our video interview series, Conversations with B'nai B'rith, on Facebook and YouTube. You'll find discussions with historians, diplomats, Middle East experts, even an astronaut and an NFL player, and a legendary DJ. Watch our latest content by subscribing to the B'nai B'rith YouTube channel and liking us on Facebook at B'nai B'rith International. Born in Jerusalem in 1919 and raised largely in New York City, Nehemiah Persoff distinguished himself after World War II on television, in films, and on Broadway, playing a wide range of characters. Some of his more than 200 credits include Some Like It Hot, Yentl, Twins, On the Waterfront, Gunsmoke, Law and Order, The Man from Uncle, Gilligan's Island, Star Trek, The Next Generation, and so many more. We talked about his new memoir, The Many Faces of Nehemiah, his successes and struggles as an actor spanning more than five decades, and his experiences as a Jewish performer in Hollywood and on stage. Nehemiah, welcome. Thank you for being here. We're so honored to have you with us today. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Well, I'm so happy we have the opportunity uh, to talk about your new memoir and uh, of the many faces of Nehemiah Persoff that were and are a part of your life. So let's begin with a question about uh, where you come from. Uh, I understand that your father worked at the B'Tzalel Academy, which is Israel's art and design school. What can you tell us about that and about your childhood growing up in those days in, in pre-state Israel? Well, I can't tell you much about B'Tzalel, the school, because my father was sent to the United States in 1923. So uh, at age four, uh, I was, uh, for all practical reasons, uh, without a father. Mm. Uh, Jerusalem that I grew in was a place that was uh, full of ideas, fervent with ideas. Of course, the old religions and uh, Jerusalem, there's something about Jerusalem that even when you're born there, you, you can't help but sense the holiness that surrounds the city. There's something about the city that's hard to put in words, but there's a holiness about the city. Anyway, so I was born there and uh, was exposed to these ideas, but also mostly to the Chalutzim, who were the new immigrants from Europe, Jewish young men and women, from Poland, Russia, who were fired by the ideas of Herzl, Theodor Herzl, and decided that it was time for them to leave the old country with the pogroms and the spitting and the hollering and the name calling and the restrictions put on Jews and to go to Palestine and rebuild the nation of the Jews, Israel. And so I was exposed to that. I was also exposed to the fact that we wanted not only to rebuild the country, but to rebuild ourselves, because in uh, the diaspora, we were storekeepers and business people. That's what we were forced to do, because we were not allowed to do any tra any any work. We were not allowed to work and uh, train as workers. And so in Israel, they inculcated the people. They gave them the idea that they must be laborers, they must be able to work and keep the country going. There's glory in labor, and uh, I grew with that. I wanted very much to be a worker. So when I came to the United States, of course, all of that changed. So you and your family came to the United States when you were 10 years old. Talk to us about your early life in America. How, would, how did you and your siblings uh, adjust to life in New York? Well. Life in New York was very different. Uh, my oldest brother, who was a shepherd in Israel, came to the United States and just could not fit into the regime of eight to five work. And uh, I was 10 years old, 
I could not get a, could not adjust to the Jewish boys in the United States. They did not have the dignity. They didn't have the knowledge of Jewish history. They didn't have, they knew nothing about the greatness of their people. They didn't know how to be proud to be Jews. They were just uh, Jewish people in New York uh, trying to make a living, trying to get by. And I didn't like that at all. So that was mainly my uh, feeling. I cried myself to sleep for about three years before I accepted the fact that I was an American, living in America. You began your career in the theater after World War II. Uh, 1947, you were accepted into the actor's studio and became a part of the first class uh, taught by uh, Elia Kazan. Uh, yes. one of the studio's founders. How did you become part of Kazan's circle? And uh, talk to us about your experience at the Actors Studio and how Kazan impacted your life. Well, Kazan was a brilliant man who had uh, theater running through his veins. His blood was theater. He was so good. He was so exciting to listen to. However, Kazan was not the person that gave me most as an actor. The man who taught me most was Lee Strasberg. And uh, he taught me by giving me these two points. If you make the small things on stage believable to you, if the chair that you're sitting on is a chair that you've sat on and you feel that you've been on it, if the furniture in the room, if the room itself, if the surroundings are real, then when you get into the actual happening in the play, the actual events of the play, you begin to believe those. When you believe those, then you are, your whole being is, gets involved in it. And uh, basically for me, that was the, the method acting. Other actors, we used to talk a great deal, but they had... Uh, Steve Hill, Eli Wallach, Annie Jackson, they all had different ideas. Each one came away from Lee Strasberg's acting with a different idea. Well, you starred in many important plays like Ibsen's Troll King with John Garfield as Pierre Gint. Is there a play or a part that you considered uh, a pivotal or a, a milestone uh, in, in your uh, performances on the stage? I think probably the performance that, that uh, got me into the picture as an actor was that of Tyrrell the Murderer in King Richard III, Shakespeare's play. Uh, I did something very unusual there, one, one which I don't recommend, and uh, but it got me into a frame of mind, an emotional frame of mind, that uh, led me into a, what I think is a very exciting performance of King of uh, Tyrrell in King Richard III. It was a small part, very small part, but it got the attention of the critics and it set me going. Well, tell us about your breakthrough on the big screen. You were often cast as men of different ethnicities and dialects, sometimes heroes but more often as uh, flawed characters. Uh, among them were, were Little Bonaparte, the gangster with the shaved head, and Billy Wilder's Some Like It Hot, or the persecuted Jewish man Hauser in Voyage of the Damned. And then in the 1980s, as Barbara Streisand's father in Yentl. Tell us yes. about, about that part of your career. Well, as a supporting actor, as a character actor, you become the heavy because the leading man needs somebody to bounce off of. He needs somebody to be angry at. He needs somebody to shoot, somebody to kill. And that somebody is a character actor that's assigned to that particular role. Not all supporting actors, like a supporting actor in Yentl was very sympathetic. There are other parts that are sympathetic, but in general, I would say that the job of the character actor, the guest actor in television shows, is to be an element in the play that sets off, that puts the star of the show in a good light. And you do that by being, if you're a bad guy, really bad. If you're a really bad guy, then the guy that shoots you is not so bad. 
follow me. I got it. Tell me, what okay. was it like working with Humphrey Bogart in The Harder They Fall? <laughs> he was quite a character, a wonderful man, a, uh, uh, very charismatic. And uh, he hated New York actors because New York actors came to Hollywood brash and full of fight and uh, the method, which is very different from what many people were used to. Uh, but he adjusted to it, and uh, it was great fun working with him. Uh, he taught me a great deal. Let me give you a small example. We were doing a scene in which the prize fighter, the one that we are supporting, came out into the hall, and he hit, he was so tall that he hit his head on the chandelier. I noticed that Bogart did not pay attention to that, and I, being a brash kid, ran over to the director and said, you know, Bogart missed a very important point. He saw this giant of a man, and he didn't even register. He said, the director said, yes, he did. No, I said, I was right with him. I looked right at him. There was nothing. He said, come to see the Russians tomorrow. Russians are the, the prince of the film. The, the, the film that was in the previous work is shown on the following morning for the, all the people to see and criticize and change, maybe. Yes, so I looked at the Russians. And uh, Bogart, when he saw him, his eyebrow just went up a little bit. And that's all. And I learned then that screen acting is very different from stage acting, where you have to reach the second balcony, and, uh, and the lifting of an eyebrow is not enough. You have to do a great deal more on stage. But on screen, just the raise, which was just the right thing to do. And I really appreciate that and was always thankful to Bogie Bogart for uh, teaching me that. Well, let's talk about your career on television for a moment. Uh, it was also uh, prolific uh, for a long time. Anyone who owned a TV knew you. Uh, even today, reruns of shows allow new generations to enjoy your career. I'm, I've seen you um, on TV many times uh, from the doomed Nazi submarine captain in the Twilight Zone, uh, to the brave rabbi in mm -hmm. Magnum P.I., uh, to the futuristic space alien in mm -hmm. Star Trek, uh, The Next Generation. How would you describe the difference between working in television and working in movies? Well, when television first started, you know, the people didn't really know what to do with it. And uh, we were lucky because the group of us me, Martin Balsam, uh, Kim Stanley, and others were actors on stage who could carry a show from beginning to end and also were the camera liked our, the structure of our face. That was very important. There are many actors who were uh, Alfred Lundlin, Fontaine, Helen Hayes, all were great actors on stage, Catherine Cornell but they could not make it in the movies because the camera did not like them. But we were a group who fit into the television mold, and at that time it was live television, and it was excruciating because if you went up on lines, you're in real trouble. And everybody sweated bullets when they went on live TV. The difference between live TV and movies is not only live TV, but also generally TV, is that you don't, in, in movies, you have much more time to think and to do two takes or three takes. In television, generally, if you swing at the bat and you hit the ball, no matter where it goes, print, that's it. So you have to know just exactly when you really want to make the effort because you have to know which one is going to be the print. And the print is generally going to be the show in which the star is good. But you have to be aware of that and be do the best you can at that time. Does that make sense to you? It does. It does. Well, talk to us about your one-man show focusing on the world and stories of Sholem Aleichem. What inspired you to, to do that? I was in New York doing a, a television show, and my, my, my agent called me and said they want to, Jerome Robin wants to see you to play the lead on the road company of uh, Fiddler on the Roof. I went, I auditioned, he liked my work very much, and he said, you know, there's a part when you come back from being drunk in the second act that I'd like you to 
to read for me next time you come, which probably would be Friday. Is Friday okay? I said, fine. So I worked all weekend on Friday. They did not call. I called my agent, and he said, well, they decided on Luther Adler because he was the understudy, and they had a money difference. So I was terribly disappointed because I loved that show. I loved it. And on the way home, I stopped at the bookstore, and they happened to have a book of short stories by Shalom Aleichem. I took it on the plane and began to read and read and read, and then I decided that this writer is so brilliant that you don't need girls, you don't need dancers, you don't need singing, you don't need anything, just somebody to stand on stage and read his words. And right then I decided I would do a one-man show. I worked on it for about nine months, cut the, the stories considerably, some stories that ran 50 pages, I cut down to 20 or 15, and I did the show in L.A., and uh, they, I got a very good reception there, and I won the L.A. Special Award for acting, and then I did it in San Francisco, and there I was the only nominee, the only nominee of the season for Best Actor and Best best Show. That was the Show Malaykum Show, One Man Show. So I enjoyed that very much. And Nehemiah, can you talk about anti-Semitism? You worked uh, in an era uh, where certainly Jewish actors were, were working and they were everywhere in TV and the movies and on the stage. Did you ever encounter any anti-Semitism either in, in your work in Hollywood or in New York? No, not in Hollywood, not in New York, not in the theater. I encountered anti-Semitism when I worked in the New York subway which had uh, very few Jewish people, maybe me and another guy, that's about it. So except for that, I did not encounter. In Hollywood, it was the actors, it was, it was the uh, acting uh, community is very liberal and uh, they have to be uh, open-minded and uh, willing to understand and accept different peoples. If a guy gets a job as a, a Russian or a Jew or a uh, an Italian or a Catholic or a Protestant, whatever it is, you, the actor's job is to get into that character and be sympathetic with him. And you can't do that and at the same time carry hatred. That doesn't work. Well, tell us about, uh, you had a career on the stage, you had a career in television, uh, you did a, a, a very well-received one-man show, and the kind of, the fourth career would be your painting. Tell us about your painting, which we've seen some of your work, I've seen it online, which is really magnificent. Um, how did you? How did you get? Do you think that? You think perhaps that your father was associated with Bitsalel, uh, that you may have uh, received some of that talent. But, uh, my father, yes, my father. Well, first of all, he was an actor. Then he also painted, and uh, so uh, I guess both of these I got from my father. I was uh, at about age 70, my telephone stopped ringing. There was no work. I didn't understand that. So I decided I'd do a one-man show again. The first one was so successful. So I did another show and I took it to San Diego and rented a theater and paid all the money for the entire production. And on, oh, on a preview night in a 600-seat house, I got 11 people, just 11 people. After that, I went to have dinner with my director, and we talked, and while we were talking, my mouth could not form the letters. My letters came out, my words came out garbled. And he slapped me in the face a few times, and about after 30 seconds about after that, I began to speak again. I called my doctor, who was a personal friend, it was 11.30 at night, and he said, you just had a TIA, which is a minor stroke. I wanted you to drop everything and come back home. And that night I went home, and he sent me to a specialist. The specialist said, I want you out of Hollywood. I want you out of the proximity to the movies. I don't want you working anymore because the pressure on me was too much. So I happened to come up here to the Central Coast, and there I found a house that I liked. And there I met a man, a wonderful man, Art Van Ryan, who was a painter and head of a group that painted. He invited me to paint with them. And uh, although I never painted before, 
I looked at them and I was so inspired by them because you meet you meet in the morning with all these people, and you talk and you decide where you want to go to paint, and when you go say to the mountain top, suddenly there's a stillness and a concentration you can cut with a knife, and at lunch we have a critique and we show each other the painting we've done, and to see. 20, 25 blank canvases turn into wonderful, wonderful paintings really inspired me. And I began to paint and I, my uh, garage became my studio and I painted till about two in the morning, turned out about 200 or maybe more paintings. And uh, that, that was, that was uh, uh, medicine for me because in order to live here, I had to take off the mantle of being the actor. I, I found that, I, that when I was acting, I was under terrible pressure to be, to be ready to perform at any moment. When you look at somebody to study them, I didn't have to study people anymore. I could just talk to them and reach them and understand who they are. But the burden that an actor carries was thrown off my shoulders. And when people ask me, how did you get to be 102? I really, the only answer I know is that I came here and I started painting. And that was, I think, what lengthened my years and, and really made my uh, golden years golden. Well, so, Nehemiah, just to close this discussion with you, this conversation, what would you like readers... What would you like readers of your memoir, The Many Faces of Nehemiah Persoff, to take from your life's journey and from all of your many accomplishments? Well, first of all, I want them to understand uh, a little bit more than they do about the Jewish people and the Jewish courage and the Jewish understanding and mind. Uh, I am very proud to be a Jew, and I wanted to pass it on to my readers. Also. I want them to understand that being an actor carries a terrible burden, terrible burden in which people don't know. They just think you're in Hollywood, you're here, you're having a great time, beautiful women, so forth. So that's not it. There are two sides to Hollywood. One is hard, hard work and pressure and tension because you're competing in a very difficult field. And the other is uh, the publicity stuff. So I wanted the people to understand what it is to be a responsible actor. And besides that, I want them to enjoy the funny stories that I had during my career, funny stories. And uh, that's what I'd like them to carry away. I'd like to make a friend, friend with everyone who reads the book. Well, that's a great takeaway. And I'm sure you're going to make many friends, new friends as a result of, of the memoir. The book is The Many Faces of Nehemiah Persoff. It's available now wherever you purchase books. Can I, can I say Amazon? Can I say Amazon? A good Amazon or any, any place you can, you can buy books, of course, it's, it's available. Uh, I'd also say, I mean, I went online to see some of your paintings, and I would um, encourage uh, our listeners uh, to take a journey on the internet and find uh, that as well to look at your your really your outstanding art. Nehemiah, we're just delighted that you could join us today. I really enjoyed your memoir. I, I know our listeners will too. Uh, I enjoy uh, seeing you um, on TV, uh, in the movies, your television programs, um, and uh, it's just great that uh, that you could be with us today. Want to wish you the best of luck for the next 102 years. Uh, it's, been, it's, been a real, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I could say the same to you. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. If you're looking for more of our diverse content, visit our website, thenaborith.org, to listen to all of our conversations, podcasts, and live interviews. Thanks to legendary actor Nehemiah Persoff for joining me today, and thank you for listening in. If you like what you've heard, make sure you subscribe to the B'nai B'rith podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. For B'nai B'rith, I'm your host, Dan Mariashin. Talk to you again soon. <laughs>